Yeah, let's start. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for coming to this session. It is scaling. Okay. Yep. Hello, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming to the session. It is scaling software supply chain source security in large enterprises. And we have our speaker, Rao Lekakula. He's Senior Director of Security Engineering at JP Morgan and Chase. So let's give him a hands of applause and welcome him to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can hear me in the back? All right, good. All right, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you, RSA, for giving me the opportunity. And also, thank you all for showing up and trying to spend time with me for the next 45, 50 minutes. I know you have so many other options, and you end up picking here. So thank you. Uh, as mentioned, so I've been senior uh, security director. Actually, some of the bank titles are fan like tricky, you know, right? I started as executive director, then they changed to senior director. Uh, I've been working on startups and also big corporations, top five companies in the world like Amazon, Bayer, and then JP Morgan last 15 years in security. So I've seen the startups and enterprises. So my talk is more around uh, going over software supply chain security in any size enterprises. What is it? Why it is important? and then deep dive into some of the complex tests involved. And then we'll talk uh, a bit more about the, some of the strategies on addressing the security of those supply chains. Then I'll end with some resources and where can you go from here. It's a general session. What does it mean is it's a little bit of introductory material, but if you have a specific question or you would like to discuss a deep dive into any particular topic I mentioned here, Feel free to grab me outside the room after the session. Uh, or you can discuss over a coffee, beer, or a fancy restaurant. Your choice, right? I'm up for it. Um, then also, I said it's a software supply security for large enterprises. The most of the concepts are actually relevant for any size company. Doesn't need to be an enterprise. So if you're not from a large enterprise, don't think about leaving. Actually, someone can close the door so that no one can leave. <laughs> we could. Um, we locked for next 40 minutes. Uh, but it's, it's more relevant. So you get the, the idea. And as I go more deep into the topic, actually, the size of the company doesn't matter. It's the application and the complex stuff the application. So we'll go into it. So before we jump into the actual talk, I got to go through the disclaimer so that I could save my um, face from legal issues. Uh, I'm sure this is legal, so you should read every word of it on this slide. I'm sure you're not going to do it. So I'm going to summarize it for you. So all the statements I make uh, and suggestions I do are strictly my personal opinions. They're not of RSA or my employer, JP Morgan Chase. And also what this means is if you end up like taking my suggestions and strategies and you still implement it and then you still get breached, you can't hold me accountable, right, or liable. Because we all know as a security professional, there is no such thing as 100% security. There's no perfect security, just admit it. What we could do is, these are some strategies we could use to strengthen our defense in depth st strategy for your firm, right, that's what it is. And also, most of the cases, things don't go as planned. I'll tell you a very brief like detour and then we'll go back. So when I got RSA talk accepted, I got excited and I went to a fancy clothing shop and got my seat, suit, right? I got measured, I got the suit last week, everything ready. Last night, the airlines lost my bag. I ended up with the RSA jacket here and stuff, a suit. So you don't know what's gonna happen. So what we could do is we could plan for, okay, if something goes and happen, we have a plan B, plan C, so that the strategies are defense and stuff. Okay, let's jump into the content. Let's start with the question. Uh, anyone can tell me which one of these incidents is not a software supply chain attack? All right, maybe we'll make it easy. The, the last one in the end is A, B, C, D, E. How many think A is not a software supply chain attack? B? C, D, 
E? Right. It's actually a tricky question because all of them are software supplies in edX. There are different types though. And also I started 2020. It doesn't mean actually started 2020. I mean, we have a long history of software supply in edX. Long before 2020, right? Some with fancy flashy names like Hot Bleed, Charles Shock, you name it. Uh, but they are mostly, there's some kind of a known vulnerability struck there, no one noticed it, and then someone finds it, and it's, we're using the software so that all of a sudden everyone has to panic and patch it. That's the typical software supply chain attacks been. But last few years, it kind of changed. We're seeing more and more new types of attacks. With solar winds, that's where I started, we're seeing it's not about vulnerability anymore. The attackers are start attacking the infrastructure, developer infrastructure, our build systems of the supplier. I name supplier here, it's like obviously terminology, everyone says differently. In my opinion, supplier is, it's nothing with the money, it's more of a someone producing software for you outside your purview, I call it supplier, right? They're attacking on the supply chain of a supplier and then injecting malicious software, malicious code, anything which impacts. We're also seeing another type of attack, which is the packages which are malicious from get to go. So these are no longer vulnerabilities in a software than someone finding, it's they are intended to be bad. So they leverage some of the automation around package managers, your deployment system, your build system. As soon as you install that package, it triggers this cascading effects to infiltrate into your network. They are designed for that. And most of the time, the way they get into your system is they deceive the developers by naming it to very common name like package out there with maybe one letter, right? Type of squatting is a good example. And we think that attacks like protest wear itself. There's a good package out there. And then whatever reason, the maintainer strongly believe that, oh, the war in X place is not something he supports and all the consumers are using is like supporting the war, so I'm gonna go ahead and introduce a backdoor into the software. All of a sudden, all you got impacted. So we're seeing more and more new types of attacks and in developer infrastructure and malicious packages by get to go rather than just a vulnerable software we used to see last, uh, whatever, like 20, 30 years, right? Um, also, I'm gonna end with another question, like how many of you got your vacation ruined by log for shell in 2021, December? Quite a few, right? And the remaining one, I think you either you are too lucky or you're probably too busy handling with security issues. Uh, but the sad news is for both of them, they're not going anywhere. Actually, it's getting worse and worse. So we're gonna see more hands if things go this trend. Last few years, I mean, Sonar Tip is a really great report. If you haven't read it, like I would suggest you to take a look at it. It's an astonishing number of new attacks in the last three years. And the trend is actually not slowing down. Experts at Gartner are actually predicting by 2025, pretty much all of us gonna have some kind of supply, supply chain attack. So what? so big deal about it, right? So if you look into like a traditional incident we used to deal in enterprises, typically few endpoints get impacted, maybe hundreds, right? Then you patch them, you take care, isolate it, you move on. With the supply chain, actually, the scale is too high. You're now looking at thousands, hundreds of thousands of systems actually using a piece of software being deployed everywhere. So it's not about just using a software, it's everywhere it's deployed to. Now you have to be worried about. The scale is very high. The second thing is, some of the traditional protections we've been relying on for years, right, decades, like firewalls or these perimeter protections, they no longer work with this case. It's more like a Trojan horse, right? The software you use uses the dependencies and software coming from someone else. So it's actually deeply embedded multiple levels your stack. It's not a, no longer a pro, like a perimeter. And actually worse, some cases, 
it actually, the software is running on higher privilege, right? You probably figured out that by the last attack, like SolarWinds, it is actually a soft secure software. We are running as a monitoring. It runs at higher privilege. Now all of a sudden you're giving a software which is malicious to run a higher privilege. So your firewall not gonna help you at all. So we have to think a, a different strategy for this type of attack. So that's the kind of what makes it different from other incidents. Then we'll spend a little bit of time on what is software supply chain. When I, I keep saying that, it's a long word. It's very similar to any other physical supply chain you heard, right? We, <laughs> we security guys, we kind of using common physical names to security terms and sometimes confusing other people. So if you take a automobile industry factory, right? You source raw supply material, you take them, you do engine assembly, you display assembly, you go through them, you build some of the automation on those, like building those parts, then you go through the distribution channel, dealers, sell it. It's very similar to software supply chain. Software supply chain, the difference is with the physical supply chain, obviously, if you're getting a, sub, a part you're going to use for a car, you have to go through a procurement process, right? You, you, you look for, oh, is it a reputed vendor? I need to buy stuff. You can't randomly buy stuff from someone else. Then you go through the process, and also there's a minimum number of packages. You can't have thousands. I mean, you have thousands, but you're not going to add more stuff to it. There's established process. Whereas the software, the problem is, most cases, it's so easy to pull in a package from world. Not only few, like hundreds of packages, so easy to get them, and most of them are free, right? So the developers, they don't actually think too much about it. Like, I want to get this thing done, and my manager is bugging me to get it by the end of the weekend. I'll pull as much as I can from the open source, build the package, get it done, move forward. That's the difference with physical and the software, because it's so easy to re like make copies of it, so easy to pull in other stuff. That makes it, the software sub supply chain actually complex compared to the physical one. But to be fair though, I think actually the modern day cars actually runs 100, close to 100 million lines of code. So actually they have to deal with both. They have to deal with physical supply chain and also the software chain. So I, I shouldn't say they are easier. Then I talked about software supply chain, we pull in hundreds, hundreds of the other package, right? But what can go be wrong? So if you go maybe zoom into one of that component, call it a open source package, what can we go, what can go wrong in that cycle? So this is a diagram actually I borrowed or steal from Salsa website because they did a great job explaining it so I don't need to recreate it. So credit goes to them and if we take a, a point where developer adds code to the repo, to where they build it, they deploy it to a, a package repo where other people consume it, you see like one, two, three, uh, five, like eight types of attacks can happen. Someone can maliciously like submit code to the repo. The repo could itself be compromised. Or we, this build system can build, which is not what is in the repo. Build system itself can be compromised. You remember the, some of the attacks I showed, SolarWinds is a good example of that. Then what is built need not be the one actually being deployed. What happened with the code cove attack is that. Someone modified it and deployed it. Then these attacks on the package repos itself. Then the last one, when consumer consuming package, there's no guarantee they will actually consuming this package. They may be consuming someone else, typo square. It's a different package. So there's all kinds of attacks, possible threats can happen in this cycle. Now, consider this, right? This is one of the hundreds of the dependencies you consume. When I say that, you may depend only on 10 packages, but the 10 packages depend on another 10, another 10, another 10. So this supply chain, like chain, is kind of recursive sometimes and goes on, goes on. Now, multiply that with all these possible threats. 
Then switch to enterprise. Enterprise software supply chain is actually a bit more complex than this. We just touch the open source software supply chain, right? With enterprise supply chain, there are multiple other supply chains. There's an internal software supply chain we all know about. Again, think, think when you think about it, no one actually do software in isolation, and we shouldn't, right? That's, that's the power of software. So 90% of the applic application code, usually you do depend on open source software. That means you're pulling dependencies. And most enterprises actually pull in not just open source, we do pull in closed source software too. We depend on the binaries to do provide some functionality. We have vendor software supply chain, right? We get their binaries, then we configure it to run in our enterprise. Sometimes we even build a small wrapper around it, but the actual functionality come from a vendor. The problem here is we don't have visibility into how they are building their software supply, their software process. What we get is a binary, but at least get, we get a binary. Whereas a SaaS supply chain, we don't even have that luxury, right? Because we're giving them data, we're giving them configuration, we're giving our stuff, they run it on their supply, on their process, like on their systems. That means it's a lot more closed in nature. Then we have another type of supply chain, hardware supply chain, right? But nowadays, there's no hardware without software. Routers, firewalls, desktop, everything actually, even the small thermostat we use to control the temperature runs software. That means you actually have a software supply chain problem, plus obviously they're gonna depend on other vendor software, other open source software, it's a chain again, then it goes through the regular physical hardware supply chain, which is the stuff is packaged, go to the warehouse, and then ship to dealers, distribution channel, come to us. Again, the attacks can happen at the time. I'm probably gonna stop here, because if I keep on going more, we're probably gonna spend all an hour on just the supply chain. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time on how do we secure them. I'm gonna ask you a question here though. So what would be, what do you guys think, where does the cloud fit here? What type of software supply chain is cloud? Everyone is on cloud these days. Anyone? Wow, I got a tough crowd here. Right, go ahead. It's close to SaaS, but it, it's got complex than SaaS, right? Because there are multiple services. Some are as infrastructure as service, so there's parts of vendor supply chain parts of SaaS, it's, it's a combination, it's complex. And as I said, like, there are other supply chains in the enterprise too, like what about your telecom providers? What about 5G equipment? They're not really hardware, it's, it's more than that. But you get the point though, the point is, we already looked at, it zoomed into the soft, software supply chain of open source ecosystem, now you multiplied all the threads with all the supply chains we talked about. Now you see the complexity of enterprise software supply chain. So how do, we, how do we approach securing this type of complexity? Obviously there's no easy, simple flip, right? I'm not gonna lie, right? I'm, I mean, this is RSA, so I'm not gonna say, oh, no vendor, vendor gonna solve it. I'm, I'm gonna be in trouble, I can't walk out from here. But the point is, it's complex. There's no single vendor actually gonna solve this for you. But what we have to do is, there are a few strategies we could look into it. How are we doing with time? All right, I got 20 minutes, so that's good. This is a bit of a crowded slide, and this, I guarantee, this is the only slide I have a lot of text, but for there's a reason, like if you wanna refer it to later. Uh, but I'll explain each of them in a little bit detail. This is a meaty slide, so we're probably gonna spend at least uh, five to 10 minutes on this one. Um, so you don't need to actually read the each word. First step, obviously, is your enterprise, you know the best. Understand what are the software process in your enterprise. You would be actually surprised and shocked if you start looking at it. You think there's a central CI CD pipeline. In reality, you have multiple shadow IT shops. 
There's definitely a central CI CD pipeline, but they usually cater for internal software supply chain, right? And also most CI CD pipelines you have in enterprise, they cater like most popular languages like Java, Python, Java, uh, JavaScript. They support package managers pulling from Maven, NPM, PyPy. But in reality, you, you're not gonna just stick with those three languages. Any big shop, you can have folks wanna use R, Ruby, Scala, all these new languages coming up every year. And CI, CD, Central, not gonna catch up with that. So you end up having actually, there is actually SDLC processes without you knowing running parallel to that. What about vendor software supply chain? Most central CI, CD pipelines don't support it because there's no build step here. It's only deployment, right? What happens if with the hardware supply chain? Right? It's a complete beast. You get actually a device with software on it. There's no build system. There's no CI, CD. There's not even a deployment. They actually install it physically there. Like, how do you go through that? So you have to first catalog what are the software processes, and you need help with the developers. You need help with the development leads and business leaders in each of the, each of the groups. Catalog them. Then identify the software ingestion points in those software processes. Where the software is coming from. What is the process actually they're procuring it? Then the next step is monitor them. Monitor those ingestion points. When I say monitor, there are multiple steps. One, we have to validate the source where it's coming from. Is it a reputative source? Is it a approved source? One. Also, we have to look at the security or the, the hygiene of the component we are actually pulling in. Obviously, there are different strategies, right? It's a open source. You could look at there's open source code cards available. You could actually, if you are adventurous, you could scan the code with your scanning tool. Fine, is there any, any vulnerabilities? There's public database of vulnerabilities out there, but there are known vulnerabilities, right? It's a good starting point. If it's a closed source, it's kind of tricky. How do you know what is in there, right? There are strategies like S-bombs. You could use some of the binary analysis to look into it. We'll go a little bit deep into that. But the point there is, the key theme we would like to there is source high quality components from fewer sources. Remember that. If we allow them to source tons of stuff wherever we don't care, it's always very hard to go back. Once a software is inside your spawn, it's very hard to delete. I was talking to Brian Fox, one of the Sona type CTO, and initially we talked about, well, log4 shell, log4j package, there's still 60 to 70% of the companies out there still downloading vulnerable log4j package, even today. So the point I made is like, Brian, why can't we actually delete it, right? That's one way to fix it. But the problem is it's not that easy. We'll break internet if we delete it. Once it's in the, in the system, you cannot simply delete it because you'll, it may be running in weird situations where you don't have control over it. Then you're breaking the next time the, it repaves or they do the bill. Sometimes it, it's not in our control. So the more we do at the ingestion to minimize that damage is the better option. And then third one, this is actually the key, and it's actually surprising not many people get this. It's, you need to start building a comprehensive map of all the assets in your form. When I say about applications, software components you bring in, your dependencies, open source, closed source, hardware, and also where they are deployed to. The deployment map is also clear. As comprehensive this is, this will be key for all other steps. This could actually go really huge to them. There are a few strategies we could talk about. But the point is, you need to have a comprehensive view about what is coming in, where it is being deployed. And this store ideally should be queryable. I'm not gonna watch for a specific big database starts with O or S or, or doesn't matter. The point is you need to have a way, if there is a new vulnerability like log4j shows up in the next couple of years, 
point that version, that package name, it should give you where it is deployed. Queryable is the key. How you implement it, it's up to you. And the fourth one is you need to start securing some of these SDLCs process we talked about. I mean, you've seen with the solar winds, you've seen with the 3CX, the latest one, it's still going on investigation. There's attacks on the supplier net, like infrastructure now. So protecting your source code repository, protecting your bill system, protecting your where you store the artifacts is, is key now. So you, there are a few strategies around Salsa is a framework to tell you like where it can go wrong and some of the recommendation. But end of the day, it's, I think you're, you know more about your build system. Understand the concept, implement the strategies. And we talk about a few of the ways, right? There's a build integrity, source integrity, deployment or release integrity. There are multiple steps you could implement those. And the last one is also important. You got all that stuff, right? We did all the great work of in, like ingestion point monitoring so that we, we're trying to catch up. I mean, that's the hard one because there are packages coming up a lot more malicious and tricky. There's no CVE attached to it, so you have to have strategies to identify those. But you did all the hard work. But if you don't monitor continuously for new vulnerabilities, it gets stale very quickly. And you have to have automated mechanism. It shouldn't be a panic every time there's a new vulnerability, right? And then having that comprehensive bill of material, that queryable store is the key because it makes it a lot easier when there's a new vulnerability comes up. So summarizing it, obviously get the point, right? Know a lot more about your software shop processes, shadow IT, bill mechanism. Obviously, the ingestion point monitoring is the trickiest of one because of the new attacks being done, but you have to start somewhere. Even as basic as look for known vulnerabilities, look for some kind of a reputational score for where the package is coming from is a good start, but you need to think about adding more strategy, like defense and depth there. And then having that store of comprehensive bill of material, then automated mechanisms to look for new attacks, kind of a good starting point on approaching this problem. So this is all good and nice, but you're probably gonna think of two things, right? Overall, how does it help with these types of attacks we talk? That's been one big question. The second one is, well, this is too much. Do I have to do all this stuff myself? Like, is there anything to help me here, right? So we'll talk the first one. How does this help with those, these bigger, broad categories I mentioned, right? The first one is easy, like known third-party vulnerabilities that you're in your software. Your comprehensive bill of material and the last step will help with that. The second one is the attacks on in, in your build system, infrastructure, your repos, your artifactory, or artifact storage system. That fourth point will help with that. And the last one is this known malicious package coming in, new attacks. That's where the monitoring of the ingestion will help. And I think you need to have a lot of, like, data points coming in there so that you could build your own strategies based on your risk appetite, though, right? Some forms, maybe you're okay with actually, you give more faster development innovation with okay to catch in the latter stage. Some, you don't, you need to be a lot more stricter, right? Maybe I won't allow any package other than it's coming from these repos. It's up to you, it's up, again, based on your risk appetite. The, the, th the second point is just like, how do I get help? Good thing is, you're not alone. Uh, with the solar winds and log four shell, there's a lot of focus this from government. Most of you know from uh, White House executive order came in 2021, right? Last year is primarily been actually a lot of government agencies like uh, OMB, ODNI, NIST been working to come up with more uh, guidance and memorandums on how do we implement those executives. But it's more meant for federal, but there's a lot of really good information on how do you approach that problem. The private sector also made a lot of uh, improvements on this area. I mean, OpenSSF, which is Open Source Security Foundation, which focuses on open source supply chain, published a lot of guidance on how do you approach that. Part of that 
it came salsa, which goes over how do you build, uh, secure your net in developer infrastructure, but there's also guidance on uh, software supply chain uh, and software SDLC process. So one of the actually, I forgot to mention, NIST published a software security uh, framework, SSDF, uh, last year, which goes over the, the overall general practices too. And then um, the FSISAC folks from financial industry, that's a very well-known organization. They started a supply chain working group. Um, I'm actually part of that. The disclaimer, I'm also on the governing board of OpenSSF, so I'm super familiar to those two. I'm happy to provide more details on the work happening there. Um, for your sector, there may be definitely groups looking into this. Then CNCF is a cloud native computing foundation they actually have uh, published a software reference architecture document that goes into the details here. So there's a lot of information here, but obviously this is also overwhelming. So the best option I would say is start involving. This is actually a field which is relatively new um, and also it's evolving. So the best way is involve. You don't need to be a premium, you don't need to like start putting money uh, probably well, someone gonna like don't think about me good, but my point is involve, participate, listen to understand more about it. As the theme of the RSA this year, it's kind of really opt for this problem is we are stronger together. This is a problem complex enough that no one single company gonna solve it. We all have to involve and providing your feedback and hey, this guidance doesn't work for my company because I do X, Y, Z different from what you are telling is a way to improve it. There are working groups by OpenSSF, working groups by CISA, working groups by NIST, and all of them, maybe one or two, but most of them are open to the public. You can jump on it, you don't need to be a member. You can listen, you can provide feedback, and every one of them I talked about over last year, they're welcoming new members. They're, they're kind of looking for people to give feedback. So I think it's a great time an opportunity, if you want to be on top of this game, is involved. Then, the last topic, uh, I think I got like 15 minutes, so I'm probably gonna spend, did I lose mic? We got, okay, good. Um, we'll spend some time on SBOM, this is a five minute topic, and also, you can't really skip SBOM without a, in a supply chain talk, right? <laughs> Everyone talks about SBOM. Um, and also, I mentioned about bill of materials and how SBOM helps with the closed source software supply chain. So I think spending a bit time helps here. So what is SBOM? SBOM is a software bill of material. And every time we talk about SBOM, people talk about food labels. There's a reason. I mean, obviously, they're very similar. But it's also a little bit, there's a, there's a little bit difference there. But if you look at the food label, right? I mean, everyone likes candy. Uh, dairy milk, the simple ingredients, right? Milk sugar, butter, vegetable oil, and some of the chemicals I don't want to even know because I eat dairy milk every day. Um, as simple as that. Whereas software, it's very similar, right? What are the components of the software? So the, I use these packages, these dependencies, and metadata about those, right? So I use this package managers, I use this build system to build my software. You provide that in a, a program, like program consumable format. There are different formats in SBOM, like SPDX, Cyclone DX, SWID. The format doesn't matter, but it's a structured document talks about the components, the dependencies in a nested format, and metadata. That's basically what SBOM is. But the problem is, in any medium to large size application, right, it's not as simple as this. It's not one candy bar. It's more like this, right? It's a box of chocolates. So the ingredients kind of goes longer and longer because they're different type of components. But in enterprise, with all these other supply chain security, it actually goes a lot worse than that. It's more like this. <laughs> Anyone can recognize this? It's the economy candy store in New York, east side of the New York, right? I love this place. The problem is every time I visit there, I gain five to 10 pounds <laughs> in six months because it's cheap, so you get a lot of stuff. 
But on serious note, it's the reality of enterprise software. If you look at the economy candy store, it's been running for close to 75 years. It's a really good store. And they bring in ton of candy from all over the world. Some are no longer in production. You find those, oh, this is from 60s, this is 70s. You can't find anywhere else. Amazing, right? Compare that to software. We're actually in similar situation. We do bring in software written by everyone. Like, it could be coming from anywhere in the world. We don't know who actually wrote it. And also, sad part, some of that software is no longer maintained, same as the candy. Some may not be even available. It's probably not your own internal repo. Same as candy store, right? It's fun to look at this, but look at this from a software perspective, it's actually saddening. Because that's the reality. So you got the, the sense of the problem. I mean, how do we operationalize S-bombs, right? I mean, we could easy to say, oh, I want S-bombs, I want S-bombs, and ask all the vendors, and they start giving you S-bombs. Now we have hundreds of S-bombs. It has hundreds of components. Multiply it. Now we have millions of data. Your comprehensive bill of material is growing. There are few approaches to it, right? Obviously, first thing I would say is if you are a software producer, start looking into producing S-bomb for software you write. It also helps for not producers too because that comprehensive bill of material I talked about, it includes your own software, right? What you're bringing in. So start thinking about as part of your application development, what format I'm going to use it. Format doesn't matter. Pick one which makes it easy for your developers because there are tools to inter change programmatically. And then also, where do you store it? Do you store it with your source code repository? Or do I only ship it along with my final product? Come up with a strategy. Both has pros and cons. Also, when we getting this closed source software and open source S-bombs, how do we store it? How do we verify the authenticity of the S-bomb? How do we verify the integrity of the S-bomb. Is it the one actually vendor giving us or something got modified, right? So you have to think about and how do you store it in a structured format so that it works with your internal S-bombs, external S-bombs, hardware S-bombs, everything in a more normalized format. And then you could also start thinking about, well, I could do all that stuff. Now it's getting into really a size that I can't handle anymore. So you should understand more about VEX. VEX is a vulnerability um, exploitability exchange. It's a format, um, actually last week, NIST published a guidance on what are the minimal element in VEX. So what VEX does it, basically maps what CVs are actually impacts the software or not. That way, instead of Every dependency and your dependency, you don't need to patch it. You could only patch which actually VEX mentions to it. So VEX is a complementary to SBOM. Get SBOM document, get a VEX document, which is also a structured document about CVE, version, is it impacted or not? Then you combine those two in your comprehensive bill of material, then your vulnerability management team will be happy. I think, oh yeah, my last slide, is summarizing this. I think I stressed this enough, but to quickly summarize, obviously, you have to understand your software supply chain, and you are the best person to do it. And then build the inventory of asset based on that, build, and build the monitoring processes, right? There's, we talked brief, uh, some of the strategies. I'm happy to dive deep later. And then secure your build pipelines, source code repositories. Uh, if you remember, like PHP source code repo got compromised like a couple of years back. So these things happen. And then start involving, as I mentioned. CISA has working groups. OpenSS has working group. The links are there. And then ask for S-bombs, the companies you work for. No one going to really tell. It's not, it's, the top-down mandate is not going to work, right? I mean, obviously, government is doing something, but in most cases, we actually have to start producing S-bombs, ask for S-bombs, work nicely with them, 
validate them, help them, right? Hey, I'm seeing a little bit different than what you're giving, like, can we fix it? I think with these strategies, we could get started on uh, addressing this big problem. So I have one more slide, but I'm going to, oh, this is a resources, which is few of the, the recent resources help you with. SSTF is the, uh, the framework I mentioned, NIST published it. CNCF has the architectural best practices. Salsa has this framework of levels. And then the first one is the government. It's a little bit generic, but you get the point for more for a developer point of view. Right, with that, do you have any questions? Maybe I'll keep this one while we ask the questions. So thank you very much. That was, that was really, really good. Um, the question I have is about the White House cybersecurity strategy that just came out a long time, a little while ago, and they're talking about assigning responsibility and accountability to software vendors. So I see you're laughing, which is my thought too. Be interested to hear your thoughts on whether that's practical or useful. I think it's a tricky question. I think you're gonna put me in legal trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to keep it generic, and I'm happy to have chat afterwards, right? That, I mean, there are arguments on both sides. I talked with some of the producers, and they were like a little bit angry, right? Like it's software, and especially the open source maintainers, right? Open source maintainers are already doing all the hard work of giving a free software, we all can use it. Now putting accountability on them, like you are responsible for that, it's not gonna work. I think they are, but again, if a company is actually like selling software and the government intention is good though. Intention is I think you need to think about security when you develop the software. And how do we make sure that accountability at the right level? Um, I think it's an area, there's no right answer to keep anyone happy. I would say it's an evolving subject. I echo the same thing, good feed, uh, good presentation, but my question is more around J.P. Morgan, and where do you see, you know, it, it, it's easy to talk about this, um, but at a company that size, are you guys, you know, are you mature in these areas? Do you, you know, what does reality actually look like? Right. Again, this is supposed to be a generic presentation, right? Not. JPMC one, so I'll try to keep it generic too. I'm not gonna say we implemented all of them, right? It's very hard to implement all of them. It's also changing. Um, but if, if a company follows the bigger strategies, I said like source from fewer sources, quality components, have some kind of monitoring mechanism. Doesn't need to be perfect, start somewhere. You can keep improving with new types of attacks then have a queryable source with those strategies and an automation around those will get you most of it. Did anyone got it all as far as I know? No, but I think most of the companies already start looking into it, it's getting a lot better. You guys are tough crowd, you guys asking questions to get me into trouble, like I try to be generous. <laughs> I mean, there's a reason, right? Our uh, JPMC legal doesn't approve of uh, the presentation if I say anything specific to JPMC. All right, any more questions? Sir. So you, um, you talk about uh, software bills and materials and, and since um, the executive order was, was you know, first, uh, uh, first published, everybody's been talking about SBOMs and aggregating them, but uh, how do you see organizations managing sort of like the, the uh, various SBOM formats they're going to be getting and uh, making them usable? Because having those in a database is interesting, but it does, it's not proactive. So are you looking for SCA tools to do that? Is there a need for a different type of solution in the market? Yeah, it's, it's a combination though, right? Obviously. When we look at three years back, the, the bigger projects producing SBOMs are actually rare. Nowadays, most of the, the, cube, uh, the cube and the CNCFA projects are actually giving SBOMs by default, so some of the vendors are producing. 
And also we see in tooling on converting from one format to other format. So those made it easier to consume some of the SBOMs and the VEX is a bigger change in how do we manage it, right? So it's a combination of those. Obviously, not all third party suppliers are ready to give SBOMs yet. So your point about SCA is a, in a way, a interim solution to get the baseline and working with the vendors on validating, hey, I'm seeing this from my SCA, but obviously I know it's not fully accurate. Can you enhance it with what we know based on that relationship? is a good way to like help them too. So it's a combination of I think all those will get us. Really enjoyed the presentation. For different things like the candy store, there's these old pieces of candy, things like that. How do we deal with those? You might not be able to get an S-bomb from these old vendors that aren't even available. The VEX was great um, to learn about that. Do you see more air-gapped or other type of mitigating solutions instead of S-bombs and VEX for companies small and large to deal with to solve those problems? Yeah, I mean, it definitely, right? As I said, it's a difference in depth. I think we got five minutes. Um, there are mul obviously, there are multiple projects, right? We're looking at only slice of your cybersecurity program. Uh, air, runtime protection, air gaps, keeping your bill systems like not connected to the internet, all that stuff is actually part of it. SBOMS gives you more of a, a visibility into where the, the component's coming in, where they're going. The protection, obviously, it has to be multi-layer strategy. Uh, so you kind of half answered that question that I was about to ask um, around SBOMS and VEX. I mean, obviously, those sound great, but they're very reactive, um, and we're kind of dependent on, is the vendor going to be mature enough to actually give us something that's worth anything? Are you aware of any kind of aggregation or any effort you know, from the community to try to build a centralized SBOM or VEX that people can pull from to, to look for some of those common vulnerabilities or things that we can look, look at when we pull in more um, open source libraries and things like that? That's actually a very good question. I'm not aware of any central one system to do that, but there's actually a, a increasing interest on what you said is actually, we call it zero knowledge verification of S-bombs, right? So the vendors are not comfortable sometimes give, like produce s bomb or maybe not even give more insight into what they use. So they are actually, we're gonna see more services like where vendors work with them, they produce the S-bomb without clients knowing all the details and there's a central place. But I'm not aware of one single one directly out there right now. But I think that's a very good question. I think there's interest I've seen from other groups on that. I think we are close to the time. So the, I said, the last question, closing thoughts is obviously, as I said, there's no magic bullet. There is no single entity going to solve this, right? So if you, if you understand your software, provide these strategies, the next time either me or someone and ask the question about, hey, is your vacation ruined by some other vulnerability? <laughs> Hopefully no one raises the hand, that's the goal. But thanks a lot.